Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. Uh, my name is Nick Harvey. I'm the president of Geno America, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to this Sun Odyssey walk around series Q&A session by Geno. Um, I'm talking to you from Annapolis, Maryland, which is the headquarters of Geno America. For those of you who are not familiar, Geno America is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of the uh, Geno factory based in France. And out of our Annapolis office, we manage the network of dealers for Geno boats across the American continent. Um, so welcome everyone to this, uh, this Q&A session about the walk around series. This is the second in a series of webinars that we've been conducting um, in the last few weeks. And first and foremost, um, I want to say that I hope everyone is safe uh, during this pandemic and that uh, um, you, know, you, you and your family and, and loved ones um, are, are all adjusting to these, uh, to these new crazy times. Um, certainly at Geno America, we've been uh, listening to the needs of our owners and our, and our dealers across the country and across the world to see how we can best assist everyone um, in this pandemic. And, and uh, we are, as everyone, adjusting. But the, uh, the future looks bright. I think uh, uh, a lot of the restrictions are being listed, lifted um, around the world. And, and I hope that we're all going to get back on the water soon. I know uh, some of you already have. And, uh, and, uh, and that's a great thing because there's nothing more than we love to do than being, uh, than being on the water. So again, welcome everyone to this uh, walk around series uh, webinar today. It's my pleasure to be here today with um, two panelists uh, uh, with me. Um, I will start with Mike Ko, who you should see up at the top of your screen. Hello. Um, Mike is a product specialist at Geno America. And, uh, and he is uh, uh, leading uh, the efforts uh, of, uh, of introducing new sailboats to the North American uh, market uh, here as relaying the messages uh, coming from our head office in France, where the main design of the boats take place. So, Mike, it's great to have you uh, on the panel. Thanks, Nick. And our <laughs> other panelist um, today is uh, the owner of uh, Geno Sonata Safe 440 Hall Number no. 4. Um, the boat's called Gilly Girl. Pat Gilligan uh, is with us, and uh, we'll hear from Pat towards the end of the webinar uh, about his experience on his boat. Pat, it's great to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much. We'll, we'll get to know you a little bit more towards the, uh, the end of the webinar. So both of you, thank you for having accepted to, uh, to be on the panel. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we want this webinar to be interactive, and uh, we've actually... Uh, made, uh, made it live for you in order to be able to, uh, to have this interactive part. So on your go to webinar control panel, um, you will see a little question mark. And um, you can use this question mark to actually send questions um, to us, the panelists. I will actually be moderating the questions. And uh, we, as much as possible, we'll try to get to all the questions that we receive. Uh, but we probably won't be able to get to all of them. But don't worry, we have a recording of all the questions and it will be our pleasure to actually um, answer those questions offline if we don't get to them. But don't feel bad. Um, you know, we, uh, we are here to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so, uh, so we look forward to, uh, to seeing your question come through on the, on the little question section uh, right here. Um, so. Uh, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll get started. I've got all of the participants muted on the call, so uh, you won't have the ability to actually talk on the webinar, uh, but only send your questions through the, uh, the, questions, uh, the questions tab. Looking forward to, uh, to, to looking at some of, those, uh, some of these questions. So without further ado, um, uh, you should be seeing uh, either on the left of your screen or the top of your screen, the panelists. And in the middle of the screen, you should be seeing um, the uh, first slide of our Sun Odyssey walk around series uh, Q&A uh, Q session. So, uh, Mike, I'm going to start with you and, uh, and Pat, uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you uh, in a little bit towards the end, but it's great to have you, uh, to have you with us. So, Mike, welcome, yes. to the, uh, welcome to the panel. How are you doing? I'm great. 
you know, I'm uh, enjoying the lockdown so far, 60 days in. I'm looking forward to getting back out on the water sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. We're lucky uh, here in Maryland, that's it. We, we can now get back on the water respecting some, uh, some strict social distancing uh, uh, aspects, but I think we're all eager to get him back on the water. So like I was saying in the introduction, we're here today to talk about the Sonodyssey Walk Around series. It's our second webinar in a series of webinar. And um, why, why did we decide to talk about the, this, the, uh, this particular Walk Around series? It's because there's so much really innovative stuff um, that you know concerns the, this eighth generation of, of Genoa sailboats. And I guess my first question to you, Mike, to get things going is, you know, when Genoa designs a boat, like what what are their goals? You know, people want to know like how do, how does a yard like Genoa go about thinking about the, the next generation of boats? So. What can you tell us about what's the sort of thought process a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, at the base level, we want every Genoa boat to be safe uh, to sail. We want them to be extremely fun to sail, and we want them to lead the industry in terms of innovation. Um, to do that, uh, we start uh, from a blank sheet of paper. You know, we don't want to have this perspective of just because something is successful in the you know, the seventh generation or a previous generation of Sun Odyssey, um, that it's necessarily going to be successful in the next generation. You know, we start from the ground up and we look around at the entire sport of sailing. If we see, you know, something that's being successful, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll apply that concept to our designs. You know, if a, if a huge ocean racing boat is doing something that we think um, can filter into the, the cruising market, we'll, we'll take advantage of that. And if we see, you know, a little, a little optimist or a little, um, you know, a little eight foot day sailor doing something that we think is going to contribute to, to our designs. We'll, we'll borrow that as well. But, you know, at the, at the base level, we, we put a lot of thought into our clients and thinking about, you know, what they want and delivering a boat that's again, safe, fun, and super innovative. So that's, that's, that's really interesting, Mike, because, you know, one could have thought that we just basically you know, take what we have and, and make it even better. But but I think we, we like to, to 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 listen to you know to a lot of our owners out there. So we, we talk about this eighth generation of Sun Odyssey. Mm -hmm. So a lot of you know of our viewers on the webinar today might not have been aware that we are on our eighth iteration of a cruising sailboat. So imagine that for a second. It's, mm -hmm. it's like okay, you take a 41 foot boat and we're we're effectively on our eighth round of of developing right. a 41 foot uh, sailboat. Right. So this is this is a series of boat, the 410, the 440, and the 490. Correct. What can you tell us that's that's changed, uh, you know, between the seventh and and the eighth generation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we we call the eighth generation the walk around series uh, because in this series of boats, the 410, the 440, and the 490, we launched the walk around decks which are really uh, an incredible innovation um, for how we as sailors engage with the boat and, and how it affects our life cycle on the boat. Um, it's a, a, a cool new way of moving around the boat and getting in and out of the cockpit with, you know, very little, with very little trouble. And, you know, it, it sort of is a, is a game changer. Um, we've also brought some other new innovations such as the convertible combings, which a lot of people have seen and, you know, different sort of, details on the cockpit and interior, but the really big idea uh, about the eighth generation is the hull shape, which allows us to design the boat from the ground up. Right, and, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, Mike, because I think it's absolutely critical, like you said. And, and so, yeah, so this, this concept of the walk around with a deck that sort of slopes down uh, from a midships back to arrive at the level of the cockpit uh, in the back is, is really awesome. And um, it's received a lot of accolades around the, the world. We can see on the screen there um, yeah. some of the awards that we got ranging from uh, the North American magazine, uh, a sail magazine that gave uh, one of our boats best boats. It was also recognized as an innovation award at the Miami Boat Show, European awards, and then uh, Cruising World magazine here in the US also gave us uh, several awards. So you, clearly the whole shape, you were talking about that, yeah. is sort of part of the whole thing. Um, 
what has changed in, in the hull shape, Mike, that you can that you can talk about? Sure. Yeah, I have some slides. Um, a slide that compares the seventh generation to the eighth generation. Um, these slides is a comparison of our Sun Odyssey 419, um, which was a previous design from this generation and only went out of production a year or two ago, uh, compared to the new 410. But um, what we're going to talk about applies to every boat in the size range, the 410, the 440, and the 490. And what you can see is that while they have very similar overall hull lengths, the hull volume on the 410 is significantly increased. Uh, you can see that uh, there's significant uh, extra volume all along the waterline from a, from all the way aft in the transom to up in front of where you know the shrouds attach to the chain plates. You know more or less where uh, where the mast sits on the boat, um, and there's just a tremendous amount of uh, added volume there, and it brings a lot of good things with it. You know it gives us a lot of more space on the interior. It gives us a lot more room for uh, innovations and amenities on the deck. Um, but the really big thing is that it makes the boat sail incredibly well. Right, and I guess that's the first thing that we look for is we, we, we look, you know, without, without necessarily talking about performance, we, we want a good sailing boat. T sure. Tell us, talking about sailing, how does, that, mm -hmm. how does it change the sailing characteristics? Like, what can you explain? That's a great picture, by the way, Mike, that you've got up there. Talk us through the impact on the on the sail characteristics. Yeah, I mean, the way to think about hull volume in a very simple way is that wherever the hull is pushed out to added volume, and you can see in the graphic here um, how much further out it's pushed at the waterline, um, wherever it's pushed out, it's it's pushing on the water. So, you know, it, 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 on the hull, it can have a, a sort of a trim tab effect where, you know, when we have a, a bow with a significant amount of volume and a stern with a significant amount of volume, it's like those two locations on the hull are, are holding it up in the water. So it, it reduces the pitching moment of the boat a lot and makes the boat, you know, a lot more comfortable uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of pitching in waves and, and in terms of comfort um, on the ride. And the other thing we have is, is that hard chine that goes the full length of the hull. And in terms of healing, you know, you can think about it in terms of the boat will heal until that chine goes into the water and then it starts providing writing moment through its hull form. This does a lot of things for us. You know, it, it limits the amount of heel we have and it allows us to increase the carrying power in the sail plan. So the boat is more fun to sail, more safe to sail, you know, more sort of similar to a catamaran and the amount of heel that you, you can have. Um, but if you think about also the ability of the boat to react to a changing sea state, if we are sailing and all of a sudden a, a storm or a squall comes up or, you know, seas get super choppy, you know, we're used to, you know, we're used to a boat getting a, a big sensation of, say, rounding up all of a sudden when a puff comes on or, or you know, the, the sailors having to scramble and shorten sail to, to, to react to a, you know, to a dynamic sea state like that. But all the added stability and flotation in this hull form makes the 440 or 410 or 490 a lot more forgiving to changing conditions like that. So, you know, the you know the skill level of the sailors, you know, doesn't necessarily need to be the deciding factor in in you know helping deal with a situation like that. So just a, a lot more forgiving. And actually, it's funny you should mention that because I've I've heard a lot about some of our dealers when we initially introduced the model that um, took you know some of the eighth generation boats 410 440 or 490 on some passages mm -hmm. and you know what we heard um is that yeah it was just a lot more forgiving basically able to carry up you know to carry that uh that that sail area uh, a, a lot longer so sure. i mean any any more like concrete example mike that you can give us uh, in how that actually makes a difference but yeah, I mean, in, in say in the case of encountering, you know, a sudden gust or, you know, just, um, you know, excessive breeze, it's, you know, that normally would make a boat want to heel over and round up the, the stern section of the chine and the full volume hull, um, it engages with the water and it counteracts that force to keep it straight. You know, if, the, if you're sailing on starboard tack and the boat wants to wind check, you'll have to overcome the force of the transom pushing into the water like it's a you know, it's a trim tab. If you if you compare to say other boats, um, you know that we've all seen, where you know normally the transom comes to a nice, uh, you know, a nice fine point or becomes narrower with the transom, 
you know, or if you have a hull that has, you know, steps in it where you have concaves beneath the max volume, um, the like that section of the hull is almost going to induce that rounding up because those those hollows, as we call them in yacht design, um, create essentially suction and they would induce that rounding up effect. Whereas this is the opposite; it would induce you to going straight. You know, and not to mention in all this that we have the twin rudders on all these models, which make a huge difference in that regard as well. Well, I was I was just going to ask you because obviously it's all sort of one package that comes together. And and a lot of talks are going on out there about about twin rudders and what they do and what they don't do and they're still yeah. they're still pretty uncommon on yeah. cruising boats. What what can you tell us about what they do and how they work? Yeah, I mean they they certainly are uncommon um, in a lot of cruising boats, and, this, and the simple reason for that is that to manufacture a boat with twin rudders um, is a significantly larger investment. You know they're you have to design the boats to handle them. The, the boats cost more to manufacture just in terms of labor hours, and you have to double all the equipment that's inside the boat. But as you know, we think, or we believe that it makes a superior boat to the point where it would be foolish not to include them. Um, and the reason for that um, has a lot to do with the theory behind rudder design. There are two important parts of rudder design that sort of uh, affect this whole thing. The first is, and this may sound obvious, but when you're using a rudder, you want it to stay in the water. Yeah, uh, and what, as much and like, as possible. Right, and while that seems obvious, you know, it, it's sort, it's you can't really have a a full, um, a high volume hull with a single rudder because you can see from the photo that I have on screen, were that boat to have a centerline rudder. It, the top of the rudder would be coming out of the water. What we, what we call the root of the rudder would be coming out of the water. Um, and to counteract that, you have to make the rudder significantly deeper, um, or you'd have to move the rudder very, very, very far forward on the hull to get deeper in the water, mm -hmm. um, which would you know, take it into the living spaces of, of a cruising boat. Um, the second uh, part of rudder design to take into account is that a rudder needs to be built on a section of the hull that is comparatively flat versus the hull around it. Right, so, for the swinging movement, right? Exactly, right, for the rotation of the rudder itself yeah. um, and for the gear inside the boat. You know, we have the quadrant, we have the, the bar that spans the rudder heads, we have, you know, we, we just have all the gear inside the boat. And so, you know, it's sort of like this concept of a full chine or a full hull and hard chines and twin rudders sort of go hand in hand. If you don't have twin rudders with a hull shape like this, um, you end up having to do some sacrifice where you're taking space away from the from the back of the boat by, you know, again making a tr uh, transom that's narrower um, yeah. or doing concaves below the waterline. But both of those solutions take away from interior space and the boat's sailing performance and the boat's ease of use. So um, we think it's just the best solution. So it's almost like when you, once you go one way, you got to go all the way, right? I mean, if you've got the, the wider volume, and we talked about that, and we, we will talk, continue to talk a little bit about that. I mean, yeah, all I mean, in all, yeah. Mike, I mean, you, you, what it seems to me, and, and again, I'm not on the engineering side myself, I'm more on the sales <laughs> right. and marketing side, but it sounds, like, it sounds like there is a lot more thought process that goes into putting the boat together and designing it than I ever thought that they could be. Uh, sure. So it's quite enlightening. I mean, we're not losing the focus on the fact that Jeannot boats are designed to be, you know, fun sailing boats, uh, yeah. you know, m m first and foremost, I want to say, and uh, and we'll have some, some real life uh, experience to share uh, in a minute. But there sure is a lot of sort of practice and training and study that goes into uh, in, into that. So, oh, yeah, I, the, the lead I was going to say the twin rudders can you can you describe like what impact it has on like the sailing ability specifically sure yeah um so as i was saying if a, if a rudder is on center line it you know just by the nature of being on center line it has to rise up out of the water um, as the boat keels over unless you have a compromised hull design um so to that end you have to make the rudder quite a lot deeper um, and because when the boat is keeling and going straight, the rudder is leaving vertical, um, it has all those twisting forces on it that we're all used to. You know, the, 
uh, you know, when, when we sail upwind on a traditional boat, we, we have what we call weather helm, um, and, you know, among sailors. And that all translates into inefficiencies below the waterline. Right. So if you go with the twin rudders, as the boat heels over and the lure rudder becomes vertical, you don't have those twisting forces on the rudder. Right. Um, so you can sheet the sails in, you know, significantly harder or conversely, you don't have to be as reactive to having the sails in and out, you know, the, the boat is sort of, uh, it doesn't need, it's not as dynamic. So if you're a team that's, or a crew that's not as into sail adjustments and you just want to enjoy a nice cruise, um, the lured rudder being vertical allows you to not have to worry about sail trim so much, no matter the, you know, no matter what the wind is doing. So again, um, back to, back to the more forgiveness, maybe in, in, in the ability to sail the boat and, the simplicity also of, of managing the boat, right? We get, we uh, we just got a great question, uh, Mike, if you don't mind me interrupting. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, we want this webinar to be interactive. And, and of course, um, I, I knew this question would come up. Dan uh -huh. is, is, sorry, Don is asking on the, uh, you know, on the chat here on the question, what happens if you lose a rudder? Uh, does the other one continue to work? And obviously, yeah, if you lose one, you can keep on going with the other one. Yeah, there's, you know, there's definitely redundancy um, in having the second rudder. Um, so the second rudder will obviously work. Um, obviously, it'll be, you know, in that situation, uh, a little bit easier the motor than sail if the rudder is going to be on the windward side of, of whichever way you're sailing. Um, but it's also important to realize a couple factors where uh, that come into play here. Number one, yes, the other rudder works perfectly, no problem. Number two, the rudders on these on these boats that we manufacture are very robustly built. You know, we have, you know, stainless steel stocks through the rudders, so they're they're nearly indestructible. Or I mean, not completely indestructible. You can break the casing on the exterior um, if you hit something. In two or three, the rudders are significantly shorter than a traditional rudder than that you're thinking about. So you know, they may be in that regard less likely to impact a lot of things in the water that you may be worried about due to the fact that the rudders are so short a lot of the hull itself is protecting the rudder already right. and that that's that's great info mike because it's hard to imagine all of the little things that go into designing those 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 rudders yep. so mike a lot of the a lot of the images that you show on the screen there um show the boat um with this sort of high performance sails and everything we uh -huh. we, we talked a lot about we refer to the performance of the boat, but you, you don't mean racing, right? When you talk about performance, we just talk about the fact yeah. that the boats basically sail well. Um, <laughs> there are other rig configuration and sail configurations, right? Other than just the standard main we see there. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. We talk about performance the way, you know, like car guys do, you know, you can talk about yeah. the car going 200 miles an hour on a track, and you can also talk about how well you know, how efficiently the motor is performing in terms of fuel economy. Yeah. So when we talk about performance in this aspect, we're talking about, you know, what I might call the power in the hull form, but what somebody else might call, you know, the sea keeping ability of a boat, like how mm -hmm. comfortable the boat is, you know? Mm -hmm. If I, you know, if I, if a boat takes, gets hit by a puff and it heels way over, um, you would say that that hull isn't very powerful. But if a boat takes puff and it heels over onto its chine and everybody on the boat stays, you know, happy, calm, content, having a nice, you know, little cruise, um, I would call that hull powerful because it resists the, the load of the, of the breeze. To that end, we have a lot of, um, a lot of rig options. You know, we have the performance sail package, um, as we've been talking about, which is um, on all three boats, a taller mast um, with significantly more sail area. Um, for people that, you know, maybe want to do some club racing or if they're, you know, um, really experienced with boats that are pretty, pretty wicked up and, you know, super high performance and, and they get the thrill out of, um, out of high performance cruising. And then we have uh, our classic rigs, uh, which are, you know, the, the, what we call the design to rig where, you know, the, the loads and the healing forces, the boat experiences are going to be optimal. Um, we have our in-mast roller furling uh, masts, which are, you know, which are super user-friendly and, and super convenient, easy to use. Uh, we can sell the boats with code zeros on, uh, out on the extended bowsprit. We can sell the boats with self-tacking jibs. 
we can sell the boats if inner four stays. You know, kind of we can tailor the boat to suit the sailing skill, style, ability, and what any customer wants to do. You know, if you want to go 2,000 miles in a straight line, you an inner four stay and a code zero is probably the right combination for you. Um, if you want to go day sailing around the Chesapeake Bay, self-tacking jib with a conventional mainsail could be the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, you know, college age kids that are on their sailing teams and they want to come home and they want to do the, you know, the, the Harbor Cup in Narragansett Bay and they're going to bring their friends and do some racing, but otherwise you're going to do some cruising. Uh, the performance rig is a great option there. That's great. So we we, we have all the, uh, all the options. So my back to the, what, back to what makes this eighth generation of Sun Odyssey uh, um, interesting mm -hmm. is also how the living spaces, both in and out, are, are organized on the boat. So you, you talked a little bit earlier about the fact that the hull is wider, not only uh -huh. in the back, but also in the midsection. Um, yep. Talk a little bit about the, the interior, uh, the, the boat, the, the boat seemed to be com comfortable uh, you know, inside on paper. Can, can you walk us through a little bit what those features are and, and how that might be different from the seventh generation? And, and while you do that, Mike, um, yeah. I've got a couple of poll questions that I'd like to throw out to our audience today um, to kind of keep it lively a little bit. So uh, while, cool. while you talk over the uh, the inside, um, I'll throw out a couple of poll questions if you guys can answer and I'll, uh, I'll share the result with everyone uh, in a little bit. We'll try to keep it fun and keep it lively. Over to you, Mike. All right. Yeah, I mean, um, you see on the screen, so again, this is comparing our seventh generation 419 to the modern, or not, I shouldn't say modern, to the current design, the eighth generation. And, you know, what you can tell right away is we have two 41 footers with um, accommodations for three couples uh, in, in both boats. And in the 410, uh, this eighth generation boat, we're able to get three near queen size square beds. You know, the beds don't have to be tapered um, anymore, and two full marine heads in them, um, which is a level of luxury that, you know, is pretty uncommon in a 41 footer previously. And you see this sort of same theme throughout the range. You know, the 440 has a lot of beautiful open spaces, a set of double doors leading up to the forward berth. You know, the 490 has that awesome center line shower. Um, and again, all this stuff is hard to find in these size ranges elsewhere in the marketplace because they're, they only come when you make that investment in the hull volume. All the stuff we've been talking about, kind of, it goes together. It's a little like the chicken and the egg, you know what I mean? Can't have one without the other. Right, and, and so I, I, I mean, I really like that, the, the, you know, the fact that there's so much to talk about in terms of like how the interior is, is laid out. Talking about like the weight and the gear and everything, uh -huh. how does how does the spreading of the gear and the weight matter in in this case in, in a boat design? And what have we done on the eighth generation, Mike? That 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 makes that uh, you know really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I um, you know I mentioned earlier that. In this new hull design, we, we carry the maximum beam essentially from the transom all the way up to the forward cabin in the boat. Um, again, seems obvious, but what that means is that inside the boat, the volume in any given location is the same as the volume you know in front of you or behind you. Again, it seems obvious. What that means is we, we now have the freedom to move the design elements inside the boat wherever we want to inside the mm -hmm. boat. It used to be that your marine head and your galley had to be at the bottom of the companionway stairs. And they, they, they used to have to be because that has historically always been the widest part of the boat. Mm -hmm. Now, the widest part of the boat is everywhere from the forward bulkhead back to the helm station. Back, yeah. So it allows you to open up your design concepts and, and move things around as you know, as you see fit, like in the example of the galley, um, the galley is a very, very heavy piece of equipment. You know, you have the sinks, you have the stoves, you have, in some cases, two refrigerators, you got the microwave, you got the countertops. You know, it's a very heavy part of the boat. Um, and it's a part of the boat that you stand in for long periods mm -hmm. while you're underway, you know, if you're preparing meals while sailing, what have you. So it makes sense to put 
uh, the kitchen, the galley, I should say, at the rotational center of the boat, right over the keel head. Um, and what that does is, one, it further reduces the pitching moment of the boat. Mm -hmm. So there's less um, response to the wave action. The boat doesn't bounce mm -hmm. around as much. Mm -hmm. And the bouncing around that the boat does do, if you're standing in a galley, the boat's bouncing around you as opposed to you bouncing around the boat. Bouncing around, yeah. Yeah. On the ground. Well, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. And again, a lot of details that I didn't know even existed. Um, but uh, uh, the... the um, the, uh, the, the result of the poll that I threw out at the beginning uh, are, are on the screen now. So 80% uh, uh, of you gave the right answer. Genoa was founded in uh, 1957. Thank you for uh, all wow. of you who voted out there. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be throwing out a few more in a, in, in a minute. Uh, so Mike, on top of making sure that everything fits and that it makes sense, um, talk to me about um, uh, the fact that the boat from a design standpoint, it's quite nice inside and airy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, have a, I have an image of the interior of the 410 here. And yeah, I mean, the all that added hull volume that, that we keep harping on, again, it gives us more space inside the boat to move stuff to. The one example that everyone always asks us about is the interior storage. You know, where is all the cabinetry? Well, again, we have all this extra hull volume, so we can add a little bit more furniture in the boat, um, so we're able to move that um, storage space down into those, you know, couches or into, uh, in this case, the uh, the, the aft-facing uh, chaise lounge there. Um, and it allows us to add uh, just a whole lot more ports for natural light. We have windows on the sides, windows on the, uh, on the roof. Um, the light just kind of pours in everywhere and it lets us build a much nicer finished product. Yeah, it's clearly it's clearly visible on the picture that you're uh, that that you're that you're sharing in there. Mm -hmm. um, we got a great question actually uh, from Oliver on the on the chat, um, and it sort of goes back to the beginning of what we were talking about earlier, okay. uh, Mike. The uh, the the question from Oliver is that it seems that the the hull is a little shallower than we've we've done in uh, in in past boats um, with that volume, you know, being carried out more than I would say deep. And the question could be there, is there a tendency for the boat to slam more given the fact that the, uh, that the hull is shallower? I, uh, before you answer, I'll just share with Oliver my personal experience um, on uh, the first 440 uh, when we introduced a couple years ago. Um, I was just blown away. I mean, you, you, you know, you imagine that boats are gonna be basically digging into the, the, uh, the water as the wind speed increases. But with this added volume, you, you tend to stay on top of it. And I certainly didn't experience any, any slamming. Can you, yeah. can you talk to that a little bit, Mike? Yeah, well, so there's a couple of elements to his question. Um, first among them is, you know, is the inside, you know, is the uh, below the waterline shallower than, say, uh, you know, a design that we're used to seeing? And the short answer is no. It's a bit of a it's a bit of an optical illusion um, when you look at the boat out of the water. Um, you know, we just have increased the volume to the point where the boat is floating a bit higher. But so, so if your question is about you know the like the keel sump and you know it, it will drainage of water in the interior, that you know it 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 still you know all sort of works the same way. Um, with regard to slamming. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, we don't have uh, a problem with slamming because we still, you know, the 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 chine that runs the length of the boat does stop back from the bow a little bit. You know, it's like a seven eighths length chine, so the bow section is still quite round. Um, and when you're heeled over sailing, it creates a finer, you know, a finer entry to the water. Um, I think we had some images of it previously. And it's the um, concept of the scow bow, isn't it, Mike? And we, yeah. we see that a lot of the racing boats as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, it incur you know, when the bow encounters uh, a wave, it's encouraged to stay up out of the water as opposed to pitching into a, into a wave. So, you know, as a wave goes by the boat, the wavelength lifts lifts the chine up. So it's not a matter of a of a boat say dropping off a wave and and hitting the next one in front of it. It's a matter of um, kind of riding over it as the wave goes along the length of the boat. So long way around, the answer is is no. And the other thing to think about um, with a scow bow, Nick, that you were talking about is um, 
with the added flotation in the bow, there's a lot more displacement available there. So like, let's say you have, you know, a, a traditional or maybe an older design boat, say from the 80s, which has a very, very, very fine entry bow, right? Because uh, that was a very popular design feature that it was coming out of racing boats. Yeah. Um, what that means is, you know, let's say that you're a long distance cruiser and let's say that you need to have a second anchor or a second anchor road. And all of a sudden you're adding hundreds and hundreds of pounds of anchor chain up into the bow of the boat. Or if you're, you know, somewhere where it's super rocky, I'm thinking of the Pacific Northwest where you don't even have an anchor rope, it's all chain, right? You, you add all that weight up in the bow of the boat, the added flotation is gonna make the boat trim more level. Whereas, yeah. you know, in an older design boat, you're, you're sticking the bow in and like that's causing, you know, an exaggeration of all the things that we've been talking about. And the same thing in the transom, I mean, you know, a, a, like, a, a tr like someone with a lot of, you know, maybe racing sailing experience would be, you know, less excited about say loading up the transom mm -hmm. of the boat with a life raft or a scuba gear or a paddle board or, or all that stuff that we want to take with us. But again, the flotation trims it all out. So it's, you know, you don't, you don't need to be worried about that as much with this, with this hull design. It's a really cool concept for when applied to cruising boats. Yeah, sure. it's so innovative. And you, you think yeah. about, you know, the amount of innovation <clears throat> that we can have on cruising sailboats. So we, we, were, we were talking a little bit about, you know, the, the, the use of space and we started with the inside. Huh? But there's a lot to talk about as well on the outside. We touched on yeah. the walk around decks, which is, you know, the key concept of those three new sailboats. But there's a lot to talk about uh, on the outside as well. And, and, and mostly like in the cockpit area. You've got on the screen um, a photo of a seventh generation Sun Odyssey there. Talk yeah. us through what the main differences are there, Mike. Yeah, so the, you know, that theme of cleverly taking advantage of all this hull volume um, continues uh, with the on-deck design. Um, and, the, you know, the general concept is that we've, in the new, in the eighth generation, we've provided essentially all the same cockpit amenities um, that you've, that people have been used to all through, you know, previous boat ownerships and boat designs. And we've just added more features. So we're looking at the cockpit mm -hmm. of the 419, seventh generation, and here's the cockpit of the 410, the eighth generation. And you can see that, you know, in terms of people sitting in the cockpits and their space relative to each other and to the cockpit table, um, that the space is really the same. I mean, it's a totally normal, totally, totally appropriately sized cockpit. And what we've done with the added beam that comes from the hull volume is we've added the walk around deck. You know, so one of the one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, do the walk around decks take something away from the boat? Um, and the short answer is no. I mean, it's it's space that we didn't have before that we're using in this really clever way. You know, there's you know, more boats are going to become more and more full volume. And, you know, we're going to see different designers do things and in different ways to take advantage of it. But, you know, most boats that we've seen so far, they just create these, you know, huge cockpits, which, you know, I'm sure are nice, but with the, you know, it's nice to have the added usability of the walk around decks. And then the 440 and the 490, we have those convertible combings, which unfold to be, you know, the gigantic sun pad that people are looking for as well. So, you know, in terms of the on-deck innovation, it's not a matter of losing anything, which, which is a question we get a lot. It's, it's a question of getting things that you didn't have before. Yeah, absolutely. And it's clearly visible on the photos that you were just showing. Hey, um, Mike, we got another great question from Oliver, who was asking earlier about the uh, um, about the uh, the bow design and everything. This time, yeah. he has a question about uh, cockpit storage and uh, specifically asking about the 410 yep. and uh, it's actually a, a perfect question because uh, um, as, as some of you may know uh, we just got back from organizing and participating in the awesome uh, Genoa Owners BVI rendezvous just before the pandemic shut everything down and uh, I actually happened to cruise on a 410 for a week and so did uh, my colleague Catherine Gear there the question that Oliver is asking is the lazarette configuration in the cockpit in the mm -hmm. three cabin format. When yeah. you do have a cabin on the port side, um, yeah. you get you get a, a a cockpit locker there. And yeah. uh, and Mike, stop me if I'm wrong, but I think the principle is that the starboard side uh, cockpit lazarette is a what we would call a wet cockpit locker, 
and the port side in the case of the three cabin is a dry cockpit locker right yeah that's correct um that's absolutely correct in the two cabin version um that port side locker opens up to be a secondary access to what would be a storage room um, and so it's important that that locker is watertight um, so in the three cabin version where we add you know the roof to the port side cabin that becomes a pan and then it stays dry so starboard side wet port side dry that's great Th thanks very much mike for uh, for answering oliver's uh, oliver's question so <clears throat> we talked a little bit about uh, you know on deck and the fact that uh, that you know the, the walk around space doesn't take any any space uh, you know away from something that was there before um, we saw you know on the inside is the same thing right it doesn't actually use up any of the interior uh, cabin space because it's just that that added uh, that added width on the uh, on, on the boat so the, the the net result of that is that you know our the general owners are enjoying sailing on the boat that that much more and I know that we we did something on the 440 and the 490 with the winch placement as well, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We um, on the 440 and the 490, we we have a convertible combings, which if you haven't seen them, they're they're super cool. This these photos right here do a good job of explaining it. Um, basically, the 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 seat back, which we call the combing, um, at a switch unfolds and the from one side of the boat to the other becomes a one gigantic sun pad, which you see on the left there. Um, to accommodate that, you have to do some more innovation. You have to get the winches out of the way and out of that part of the boat. So we move them to the inboard side of both uh, the steering wheels, which you can see there. Um, and that has a whole lot of added benefits. You know, people sitting in the cockpit um, can get a handle on the winch without having to, you know, get into uh, you know, some kind of crazy adventure or racing pose or something. <laughs> and the and the boat's just so much easier to single hand. You know, if you're you know if you're by yourself, the autopilot control is usually on the center cockpit table. Um, mm -hmm. in between the two wheels, there's also a repeater um, at either wheel. But um, it's very easy to sort of one hand on one wheel, start the boat through attack or attack the boat using the autopilot. Um, Take the jib sheet off one winch, bring it onto the other winch, um, get the boat on its new point of sail, and, and and get off going again. So getting the winches into the middle of the boat has proven to be absolutely a huge benefit. And actually, while you've got this picture on the screen, Mike, um, another question that comes up often is, um, you know, you look at the walk around deck and that deck that sort of slopes back to the cockpit, and and you know, if are some some of the other boat builders are, have been quick to. Uh, to point out that maybe keyword maybe a lot of water would be running down those those decks. T right. Tell us how that works and what happened in the mind of the designer when that came up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's it's fairly you know, it's it's fairly easy to look at that and think, oh, you know, it's like a it's going to be a shoot for water to come flying into the boat and splash around in the cockpit. Um, and that came, we took that into account and we designed the boat. Mm -hmm. um, all that hull volume we've been adding um, and putting, especially up in front of the, up in front of the uh, shroud chain plates and under where the mast is, mm -hmm. that trims the bow of the boat up, like we've been talking about. So it reduces the tendency of the boat to sort of go bow down and bang into a wave and take water over the deck. Right. So the boat's already significantly drier than a previous mm -hmm. generation boat or another design boat you may see out in the marketplace um, is. Um, so already a lot less water is coming in. The water that does come in, um, yeah, it runs down that leeward side, but we have a very um, efficient scupper system to, to handle that amount of water. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, you know, it's the amount of water that should you not have had a walk around deck in the first place, you know, it'd be getting your butt wet. So, yeah. you know, in this case, it, it gets your feet wet and only when you're on the leeward side of the boat. So, yeah. you know, I, you know, that is a bit of a um a, a red herring sort of in the marketplace because you know there's no you know there's no issue with it at all yeah yeah it's a good point and, and uh you know and that that same slide that you've got up on the screen there actually uh, uh on the uh, you can see a little bit of it on the on the left hand side picture uh yeah. and not so much on on the right um we got a great question from scott uh regarding canvas 
obviously okay. with the walk around we had to engineer uh, the protection in the cockpit from a bimini standpoint a little bit differently it, yeah. in just a one sentence mike because we're quickly running out of time um what how is the canvas designed on that new eighth generation walk around series done um well, there's, there's a long answer and a short answer. I mean, the short answer is the factory standard canvas that we provide um, all takes into account um, all these elements. So uh, up forward, the you know what we would call the dodger or what we sometimes call the spray hood. Um, that is the, uh, the width of the inboard uh, section of the boat, meaning it does not go over the walk around decks. It's at the inboard sides of the combing. And we've uh, made it longer, right? It goes further back than a normal Dodger. Correct. Yes, 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 absolutely. It, it does come further after another Dodger. And then uh, we have the Bimini, which just covers just the, the helm stations. And that goes from rail to rail, um, including the walk around decks. And then we have a larger fabric connector piece that is tapered. So it's wider at the back and uh, you know the width of the Bimini at the back and the width of the Dodger at the front. Uh, and that zips right into place super easy to to do um and then we measure when we design all that stuff we measure from the floor up to um where that bimini is to take into account you know the average height of uh you know a tall person so you know you don't have to duck your head to go under it or or anything like that right and i think that yeah that's that's the that's the key concept maybe having the slightly smaller bimini covering the helms is to give us that access to the sort of you know, five ten headroom or six foot headroom, just a yeah. maybe a little bit less than that as you walk down the, uh, the the walkway. Well, it's awesome. We're getting a lot of questions on the uh, on the on the uh, the chat group, uh, which is great. I see a question here uh, from Massimo asking if there's a plan to develop the walk around series on smaller boats than four ten. We don't know yet, Massimo. We uh, we we would love to see that, but it's. Uh, I, uh, I am not inside of the uh, of, of the design office to, to answer that question yet, but uh, yeah. um, but uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping that we will see this there. such great innovation or other types of innovation from Genoa uh, actually uh, uh, come through that. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you very much for you know for all the explanations and things like that. Uh, it's it's great to sort of know we, we know. We know we have a good boat, um, you know. We 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 just uh, we just like to dig in the the details of uh, of, of why we have the uh, the the you know made those choices and what goes on in in behind the scenes. So, talking a little bit about you know what does that mean in real life? It's my pleasure to welcome back uh, to the panel. I introduced him at the beginning of the presentation, my friend Pat. Uh, Pat, it's awesome to have you. Uh, you you're the owner of uh, 440 hall number four um and uh I, you know i'm, I'm not going to do a better job than yourself at, at introducing yourself Pat. so uh, you know I've, I've decided to bring you onto the webinar because i think you have a really great perspective on you know on on this whole thing of this eighth generation um tell us in, in a couple of sentences pat what were your goals of, of cruising and, and how did you think that that Geno, uh, would help and, and meet those goals? And tell us about you know a little bit about your background and your experience. Yeah, so um, I come from a marine background. I'm, an, I'm a former United States Coast Guard uh, search and rescue boat coxswain. And um, thank you for your service, after, Pat. Yeah, thank you. Um, after that, I became a marine law enforcement officer. So I've been on the water for uh, you know close to 38 years on you know, patrol boats, power boats, and uh, always wanted to uh, slow down a little bit. So I figured sailing would be a good thing. We, me and my wife, Tracy, we've taken a bunch of cruises um, on cruise ships, and we always wanted to stay longer. You know, you, you get in at eight o'clock in the morning, and at four o'clock in the afternoon, the boat's leaving the dock. And I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if we could just stay here, you know? So, um, you know, I, I posed a question to her of, of, you know, getting involved with sailing, and we went down to uh, the Annapolis Boat Show, and we saw, um, you know, all the boats, and then we came upon the uh, the Genos, and um, they really, you know, with with the new 440, that was the one that was, uh, they were uh, 
present it was their first time ever showing it and they put on a beautiful presentation and uh we totally fell in love with it when we saw it my did wife did you really have any plans uh, pat at that stage did you have any plans to go offshore were you were you thinking maybe a different type of boat were you what, what was going through your mind well i definitely had ambitions of you know doing caribbean and um always wanted to go over to see the mediterranean so uh I was looking at some blue water, you know, what you would get a traditional blue water boat, but, um, you know, it just wasn't checking all the boxes for us as far as my wife goes. Uh, she wasn't too happy with the size of the cockpit and the interior of the boats. The, the interior of the blue water boats is like, you know, not as big and beautiful as this boat. So when we came on the 440 for the first time and we saw the walk around decks and we saw the, you know, the, the beautiful cockpit and the volume down below, it was, uh, you know, love at first sight. So talk about blue water. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that. Well, right now you're, uh, you're live from Hilton Head, South Carolina. So, uh, we, we Where just got been? back. Where are you coming from? We we just got back from uh, the BVI. We I took the boat down there, single-handed it from Long Island Sound, from Huntington area, and um, I took it all the way down. I went to the boat show for four days, and then I continued on, and I took it all the way to uh, to BVI to Tortola. That's and, awesome. Uh, and now I'm on my way back. Now I'm on my that way back. Yeah, and and I know we we uh, we were with you guys uh, down in the BVI and Tracy. Shout out to Tracy, by the way, who's, uh, Hi, who's honey. listening in to the <laughs> webinar. Uh, so I'm sure she's happy to see you uh, there yeah. on the on the screen. Um, Pat, it's 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 been awesome to get to to get to know you, and uh, I wanted to ask you specifically um, some of the things that like Mike talked about. Um, how does that translate in real life? Like like the rudders, for example, the double rudders. Did you get in heavy, in any like heavy weather? coming back up or going down to, to the BVI? How does, how does that translate in real life? Absolutely. Um, I was in, you know, several situations, um, multiple times where I was in three meter seas, uh, maybe more. And uh, I can tell you right now that the ramp story is, is bogus. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, take, we take a little bit of water and it runs down the ramp a little bit and 99% of it goes through the scuppers and out of the boat and you don't even know it's there. Um, sometimes when we take a real good heavy wave, you know, if the scupper can't handle it, we'll then go right out the transom door. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there's, there's no um, spookiness to it. So that's, uh, that's a myth out there. So you can put, <laughs> you can put that, you can put that myth to bed. <laughs> the, other th the other thing is with, with the twin rudders, you know, I, I was talking earlier, once the boat takes her position and gets on her chine, um, it's like an, another hull. The, you know, it, go it goes to my, my expertise in, in power boating. It's like a V hull. The boat lays over on its side, it gets mm -hmm. on that hard chine, and the boat is like on a rail. Mm -hmm. And nice. having, that, having that full rudder in the water, there's very little... Um, pressure on the wheel the wheel i can hold it with one finger and the boat just zipping right through the other thing i want to say bef before is we left um saint john with 40 somewhat other boats and we were the third boat to arrive in the usa so <laughs> the 440 is a rocket ship i can tell you that right now <laughs> yeah it's interesting what you say Pat, because obviously we followed your, your progress and everything and you you mentioned earlier you know, blue water and, and people thinking that they have to have a blue water boat and, and blue water boats are great. Um, you know, there's no there's no uh, uh, bashing going on here, but but for sure we, we were in a different sort of segment. And and interestingly, actually, production boats is what you see the most out of people that are doing big passages mm -hmm. and big, you know, offshore cruising. And, and one of the reasons is because they know that wherever they go, they're going to find someone you know, and right. uh, no pun intended. And uh, <laughs> and so, and, and but it's yeah. it's true, right? And and also in your case, the fact that the boat is sort of you know nimble allowed you to get ahead, get ahead of bad weather, and 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 get ahead of the other guys, right? Yeah, there's no question about it. We we definitely use the boat speed to uh, 
to keep us safe. I mean, we, I was monitoring the weather. We, we used Chris Parker's weather service and uh, I was using the radar and I was, I was running around squalls and running around uh, thunderstorms with the, mm -hmm. with the speed of the boat. There's no question about it. And the other thing, like you said, Janelle, I, I got down to uh, Puerto Rico and the first, one of the first places I went was the Janelle dealership in uh, Fajardo at uh, Puerto Del Rey Marina. Yeah. So it was fantastic to have them there. You know, they were, uh, they were great. Yep. So, Pat, we talked a little bit earlier about the uh, the galley placement in the boat, and uh, and Mike mentioned the fact that we did away with the overhead storage, um, and uh, and and sort of relocated that storage around the boat. And again, you know, the visual aspect of that is so different because you really feel like you're going to be missing some storage space. Mm -hmm. What has been your experience as a guy that lives on board? Uh, you, you and Tracy, and sometimes another crew member in terms of galley storage. We we haven't had any problem with it at all. Again, it's another myth. I, I'm sitting right here at the captain at the chart table, the captain's table, and I'm looking out the window at manatees right now. And uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that if there was a big clunky cabinet in front of me. So what they did is they just moved everything a little lower and. You know, you, you, you have cabinets, you have the storage under the satay, you have storage under the uh, under the decks here in the salon. And there's plenty of storage for all the um, your provisioning. You know, we we provisioned, you know, multiple, multiple times for long trips yeah. and we've never had an issue with uh, storage. Yeah, that's great. So you you took delivery of your boat, Pat and Tracy, I think in July of 2018 if my records are, are, are correct. Um, uh, we, uh, we had a question come through on the chat there uh, from Charlene who asks if um, she's interested in knowing if, if how you made the decision to go for the 440 versus the 410, but I think the 410 wasn't out <laughs> at the time that you, uh, you chose the 440. So right. unfortunately you, you may not have an enlightenment for Charlene yeah. on that question. The only thing that I could say to her is if the 410 was available, I might have gone for the 410. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, I'm so glad that it wasn't because <laughs> I'm happy with the with the extra length of the boat. Yeah, there's a couple of things that we yeah. do on the 440 that, that we don't have on the 410, like the convertible combings that Mike was was referring to, for example. You need to mm -hmm. step into the 440 for that uh, for, for that option. So one more question that I have for you, Pat. Um, you uh, some of the things that uh, we heard, you know, again uh, out there at the boat shows and things is that because of the new galley configurations, you know, we we had concentrated the, the seating area in the uh, in the salon area to the starboard side and didn't have a, a, a bench on the port side. Of course, we, we have the late chaise lounge on the 410, but not on the 440 and 490. Do you see yourself missing that? No, not at all. No, it's, uh, you know, I like the fact that I have the double doors going into the, uh, you know, the main cabin where on the 410, it doesn't have that. So mm -hmm. I, I like that. It opens the boat wide open. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest with you, we don't spend a whole lot of time down here. We're, we're up in that big, beautiful cockpit. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good to hear. <laughs> So Pat, I mean, it's it's awesome that you're talking to us like right right from the boat. What, yeah. What's next for you? What 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 is your what's your big plan? I mean, short term, medium term, long term. Well, I'm I'm on my way back up to you know my home, which is on the Long Island Sound, and um, on the way I'm going to be stopping at Annapolis, and we're going to bring the boat in. We're going to have some service done to it in Annapolis, and then I'm going to continue on up to Long Island. So my my um. It, I should be I should be in Annapolis within the next several days, and then uh, and then I'm going to come back down to the boat and I'll bring it home. That's awesome! I and mean, shout out shout out to the uh, uh, Long Island based uh, dealer, the Coney's team there. Who, uh, to, who to my friend to my friend Grant and the great guys at Coney's <laughs> Marine in Huntington. And they, you've been, you'll, you'll you'll been be, a uh, lot of help. Reunited help. with them. Uh, reunited with them soon. And then after that, Pat, I mean, are you are you dreaming of further destinations? <laughs> yes, well, I'm leaving. I'm going to bring the boat home and I'm turning around. I'm going right back down south. So I'm probably going to do uh, the Keys, Florida Keys and the, the Bahamas with my wife. Yep. Well, that's cool. awesome. 
And yeah. are you are you thinking that one day you want to cross over to Europe? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's we're, we're trying to get the experience under our belt, and um, the Mediterranean is the goal. So let's see what happens. But that's the goal. That's the goal. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. It's it's so good to hear from you, and we look forward to seeing you here in Annapolis uh, uh, when uh, when when you when you get here. So looking forward to it. Well, we we were uh, it's hard to believe, but an hour has gone by, and we've uh, we've chatted about the, uh, the the Sun Odyssey series, and I've gotten a lot more questions on the chat, and unfortunately we can't get to them all. Uh, but as I was telling you, we have a, a recording of all those questions. And so uh, uh, if you've sent us a question and we haven't had an option, uh, an opportunity, sorry, to get back to you, um, I see questions from Robert, uh, I see questions from Scott, I see questions from Daniel that we haven't gotten to and, and so on and so forth. So you guys, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation in this webinar today. Um, we will get back to you individually on all your questions. The team at Geno America in Annapolis remains available as well. Uh, to answer all your questions. And of course, our fantastic dealer network is out there uh, to let you try and demo the boats if you haven't uh, already done so. And uh, I just want to conclude by uh, thanking the two panelists today, Mike, a uh, product specialist at Geno America, and Pat uh, mm -hmm. and, and Tracy, <laughs> proud owners of a, of a 440 um, Hello, from Long Island, but who would like to travel <laughs> the world. Um, thank you, everyone, to all our attendees. We had a uh, uh, hundred people uh, join us today for this uh, for this webinar, which is wow. very exciting. And uh, and look out for more webinar from Geno America. So, from the Geno America headquarters <laughs> in Annapolis, Maryland, thank you all. Have a great day. Stay safe, and let's go boating. Take care, everyone. <laughs> bye. bye bye. Bye, Pat. Thank you. Thank you.